two, and one. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this event presented by 192 Books and Paula Cooper Gallery. This evening, we have the pleasure of welcoming Lucy Bradnock to discuss her new book, uh, No More Masterpieces, Modern Art After Arto, published by Yale University Press, which looks at the reception, circulation, adaptation, and reshaping of Antonin Arto's radical and revolutionary thought in American post-war art and performance. Lucy Bradnock is an associate professor of art history at the University of Nottingham. And this evening she's joined by Stuart Comer, chief curator of media and performance art at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And to kind of set the stage for the conversation, if you uh, forgive me this, this theater metaphor, um, I just want to say a few words about Arto and about the book and then pass it over to Lucy. Um, Arto is such a singular figure in French letters in that he was during his lifetime and also in his afterlife, uh, as we read his work, both absolutely central in intellectual life, especially in the realm of the theater, and also utterly isolated. He had ardent supporters in the theater world. Um, he enjoyed the friendship of some writers and artists like André Gide or Jean Dubuffet, but he remained a lifelong exile and outcast, in part involuntarily because he spent so much of his life in mental institutions, but also because he was constitutionally repulsed by, quote, the conformity of institutions and by anything that smacked of order, power of society. This is arguably what set him relatively early in his career on a collision course with Breton, the high priest of surrealism who kicked him out of his coterie in 1929. Interestingly, unlike Georges Bataille, another dissident surrealist, Arto never formed a concurrent school of thought to surrealism, nor did he publish a journal, teach actors a method, or weave a network of ally allies in the world of academics, artists, and intellectuals. There is no social moment around, around Arto. Um, what Arto left at the end of a life shortened by mental illness and the barbaric treatment of psychiatrists, wartime psychiatrists, um, was a body of prophetic, vituperative, um, relatively disconnected text from which the outlines of his creative vi vision emerge. He was, after the bloody vital core of culture, the whirlpool force, the unbearable truth, quote, that bourgeois society keeps at bay out of fear, dishonesty, hypocrisy, and, quote, sordid contempt for everything which shows distinction. And this quote is from um, his essay on Van Gogh called The Poet Su Suicided by Society, um, which um, he opens with the claim that Van Gogh showed incredible mental stability in managing to go through life and only burn his hand and cut off his ear. Arto was for a form of theater that acted as a stage for embodied reality, a reality understood in metaphysical terms, a reality more real and therefore more sacred than the washed down, impoverished, debased version we commonly experience. And so we owe a debt to Lucy Bradnock, not only for rereading Arto's work, but also for carefully tracing its reception in the US, starting with that Van Gogh article just quoted, the first translation of which came out in 1949, less than a year after, after Arto's death and soon came to the attention of major artists on both coasts, including most notably Clifford Still, who immediately assigned it to his students. And from here on, it is fascinating to watch Arto's thought catching like wildfire in artistic and intellectual communities from Black Mountain College to the West Coast countercultural scene and beyond. As I mentioned before, there is no school of Arto. An important point Bradnock makes at the outset of the book. And despite this lack of a coherent and digestible teaching, or rather precisely because Arto has remained, had remained a forceful voice in all its modulations rather than become a fixed text, he spoke in different ways to artists from John Cage and Alan Capo, 
to Wallace Berman and Bruce Connor and to Carolee Schneeman and Nancy Spiro. And while various art historians have pointed out discrete connections between Arto and some of these artists, Brad Knox's book is the first to highlight the remarkable continuity of the engagement with Arto across these very distinct spheres of artistic activity. And thus, by examining Arto's American reception, Brad Knox reveals a previously unseen kinship between artists separated in time and space, but nonetheless similarly invested in oppositional pol politics, the foregrounding of the body and embodiment, and a critical and material use of language. So No More Masterpieces is a truly stimulating book, and it is a pleasure to host a conversation <laughs> about, and about Arto and his legacy. So thank you both, Lucy and Stuart, for being here with us. We're really looking forward to this. And I'll pass it over now to Lucy for a short presentation. Thank you so much, Anthony, um, for such a generous and engaged introduction. Um, and thank you to everyone at, at 192 Books and Paula Cooper Gallery. And thanks, of course, to Stuart for, for joining us this evening um, to think through some of the ideas that I trace um, in the book. And I wanted to start really briefly by articulating some of those kind of themes and questions that run through the book and that motivated my thinking as I researched and wrote it. I have brought um, a, a few slides, so I'll just share um, my screen, um, if only just to kind of introduce some of the key ideas and artists um, that I look at. So hopefully everyone um, can see uh, the cover of the book, um, which I've used as a kind of starting point because this image I think really gets at the heart of what I was trying to do with this book. It's actually the image that I kind of imagined on the cover right from the very start. And it um, helped me kind of think through some of, of the questions of what was at stake really in approaching Arto, um, not necessarily through his kind of original works in French, but through their reception, their dissemination, um, often their, their not terribly accurate translation um, in American poetry journals and little magazines in the post Second World War decades. So this image on the cover of the book is a piece of male art uh, produced by the Los Angeles based artist Wallace Berman in 1964 and sent to La Lawrence Ferlinghetti, um, who published the Arto anthology the following year. The image that is verifaxed onto this sheet of paper is a composite image, and it takes a photograph of Arto taken probably in around 1920, looking actually pretty young and dapper. And Arto, of course, um, had an early career, pretty successful career as a, a film actor. But that image is um, collaged into this other image, which is taken from an advertisement for a Sony handheld transistor radio that Wallace Berman cut out of Life magazine in 1964. He collaged those together and ran them through a Verifax machine, which is like a kind of predecessor of the photocopy machine, and sent the image to Lawrence Ferlinghetti asking slightly cheekily for a free copy of the Arto anthology when it was published. And the image I think speaks to the kind of ideas of, of transmission and translation and distancing that I'm really interested in in this book. I became really interested in the question of, of quite what was at stake for American poets and artists and theater makers coming across the work of this uh, French writer and theater practitioner. Um, the sort of distance between um, 1930s and 1940s Paris and 1950s and 60s and 70s America and quite what they saw in this quite unusual and very kind of multifarious body of work that, as Anthony said, Otto left behind when he died in 1948. 
the translation and publication of his work was was quite sporadic in the United States. Only a very small fragment of his of his whole body of work was translated, but it appeared in these poetry journals. His words appeared uh, were were broadcast on American radio. His famous radio play to have done with the judgment of God actually first broadcast in 1964 on KPFK, West Coast Radio. So I, I'm interested in the kind of slippages, those, those moments, those gaps that open up in the transmission and the reception of Arto's work, which I think Berman encapsulates so beautifully in this um, kind of photo composite work. And as Anthony said, Arto really occupied a, a kind of position of, of utter revolt and revulsion, one that um, set him against institutions and all forms of organized authority, whether that was government or religion or the cultural authority of the surrealist group. So in the book, I'm really interested in the way that this plays out in uh, material terms, in linguistic terms, and in corporeal terms. And the theme of the body runs through um, much of the work that I look at in the book. And I'm thinking about the body quite broadly to mean the body of artists and their audiences, the body that is the work of art in all its materiality, the body of language. And so I look at works like those of Bruce Connor, I've put up his assemblage Snore on the left-hand side, which reads sort of as a body in the process of, of its decomposition or its dismantling. Placed alongside this work by Nancy Sparrow, and, and I think there's, there's kind of quite a lot um, that these two artists have in common. We can also see the body not just as a, a kind of problematic site that has to be dismantled, but also potentially as a kind of site of aggression. And that image on the right hand side, which is a, a detail from one of Sparrow's vast Codex Arto scrolls, sees the body kind of pushing back against the gridded language um, that is itself Artaud's um, text. So that head with the kind of aggressive, quite phallic tongue that's disrupting words and disrupting language. The idea of disruption and anarchy runs through really all of Arto's works, anarchy as a, a kind of productive um, site of disorganization. So uh, it allows artists and poets to kind of work against organization, um, anything that kind of seeks to put the body in its place or to organize people in society is fair game for our toe. And we can kind of read that through the, the physical precariousness and dismantling of a work like Snore, but also through the, the kind of linguistic dismantling that we see in Sparrow's works on the right. In some senses, these are works um, that show the kind of spirit of our toe. Um, not all of the artists that I discuss in the book are citing Arto directly, although, of course, Nancy Sparrow here is and citing him actually in French. Um, but there is a kind of spirit of Arto that proposes that idea of anarchy and disorganization, the dismantling of artworks, of social structures. One of the things that I really want to get at in this book is that that kind of dismantling doesn't necessarily have to be a kind of violent gesture. Quite often when we think of Artaud, we think of cruelty. Um, we think of his theatre of cruelty manifestos that have often been read in relation to kind of violent or aggressive or gory performance. But I really wanted to get at the idea that that dismantling, that anarchy, that disorganization that Arto proposes can also take on a kind of more poetic um, frame. So we see also the kind of dismantling of the authority of the artist and the kind of physical coherence 
concept or conceptual coherence of the work of art. Um, the idea that, that Artaud is advocating for no more masterpieces undoes that kind of idea of, of the coherence and the autonomy of the artwork. So we might see um, Artaud's influence in something like Wallace Berman's Loose Leaf Journal seminar that we can see on the left hand side here, which he produced really sporadically on a, on a handheld letterpress between 1956 and 1964 and would mail out to his friends. And in something like that, there's a kind of infinite reordering that is possible. You would open up one of these things and, and kind of read it in the way that you wanted, scattering the pieces in some cases, and, and some readers who received this actually kind of tore them and make made new works out of them. That kind of um, dissemination, that scattering of attention and of um, control and authorship is, I argue, also a kind of cruelty, something that sets about kind of dismantling the idea of the art workers as this contained, autonomous, authoritative um, thing. And so I also look at performance and the politics of performance to think not just about, about that kind of anti-authorship as something that involves collaboration and cooperation, as in the case of Alan Caprow's happenings. And I'm showing you an image um, from the 1966 happening gas here on the right hand side. But that these are also works that see social structures dismantled. So the idea of a kind of um, conventional relationship between the artist the artwork and the audience is disrupted when audiences become participatory. But I also argue that, that happenings and many of the performances that I look at in the book are also invested in kind of rethinking societal or social structures, that they rethink positions and positionalities, and that that is also a kind of anarchy or a kind of disorganization, if you like. So I'm trying to kind of propose um, this afterlife of Artaud as being something that isn't just about aggression or violence, that we can rethink cruelty as something that's about a kind of rigorous dismantling or undoing. And if we do that, then we can think about some of these works that we don't necessarily offer and see placed alongside each other to see um, a much more kind of consistent, if quite sort of haphazard and heterogeneous um, engagement with his ideas. I suppose one of the things um, that's really important to say is that I'm not kind of proposing this single vision of Artaud that can be mapped onto kind of, you know, every single work produced in the US during these decades. And actually, this book is um, as much about several versions or visions of Artaud as it is about the man himself. So that kind of idea of transmission and translation and gaps and distancing, I think is really important. And, and um, I'm sure we can kind of talk about that a little bit more. Just before we do, I wanted to, to kind of bring in um, a quotation that, that really kind of um, drove me and inspired me as I researched and wrote this book. Um, and it's a quotation um, from Susan Sontag, who wrote um, several essays on Arto, actually. Um, but this, I think, is really sort of sums up some of the contradictions that inhabit both his work, but also his reception, um, particularly as it kind of played out um, in those post-war decades in the US. She says, like Saad and Reich, Arto is relevant and understandable, a cultural monument, as long as one mainly refers to his ideas without reading much of his work. That idea of fragmented reception is really crucial in the United States, where lots of his work remained unpublished for a really long time. 
the idea somehow that Arto can both be a, a cultural monument, but also somehow not worth reading or perhaps somehow unreadable um, is really kind of gets at, at some of the kind of tensions that I unpack across the book's chapters, where Arto can inhabit multiple different roles simultaneously and mean different things to different people and is sort of co-opted in the American context, in the context of the Cold War and the atomic age, in the context of the rise of second wave feminism and identity politics, so that he becomes kind of usable, um, something of a, a, a brother or a, an ally or a surrogate for American poets and artists. And perhaps um, this quote will, will kind of um, inspire, <coughs> excuse me, our conversation this evening as we kind of prod and probe some of those um, connections. I'll stop sharing my screen. <clears throat> there we go. Um, and uh, invite Stuart to maybe to offer your thoughts or your responses. Thank you so much, Lucy. And, and again, uh, just echoing Anthony's congratulations on this fantastic book. And, you know, just one thought that occurred to me, it's just, you know, for a figure who was so dedicated to incoherence and illegibility on some level. Your book ironically performs the reverse function and creates illegibility to a pattern across a century, really, that I think is incredibly useful for me. And I guess just even maybe responding to the Sontag quote, which is so fabulous, but the first thing that comes to mind because of the company in which she situates him, um, specifically Saad and, and Reich, is, is this idea of erotics, really, and the body itself, not just as a conceptual enterprise, but a living, breathing, physical thing. And, you know, when you get to Bruce Connor and you mentioned this in the book, you know, Bruce talked about like cutting the skin, you know, he was really, and if we think of a skin as something that bounds something to create a coherence out of a messy system, you know, there's something in there that I think is at the core of your argument and also the, the core of, of Artaud's project or his sort of, you know, very previously difficult to trace influence on, on many of these artists. And I guess, I just wanted to add a very brief personal note just to, um, I just suddenly had all these flashbacks to the late eighties when I was an undergraduate at Carleton College in Minnesota, which was where actually ironically Brecht's Caucasian chalk circle was had its first you know, live presentation in this country. Um, but at the same time, I was taking a, a symposium or seminar on theater of the absurd. And, and we spent a great deal of time talking about theater cruelty and these notions, but it was exactly the same moment that one would go to see Kathy Acker read, for instance, or that the punk movement was in its final throes, or we were in the height of the AIDS crisis. And many artists in that moment were rethinking the body. And I think they were you know, indebted to the generation that you're dealing with in this book. And so even if you think about like the legacy of assemblage or the legacy of Cage or Carly Shaman or any of these figures, you know, on that subsequent generation. Um, it's interesting to me, but I guess I'm also mindful that that moment when I was an undergrad, the internet had not yet been born. And this is maybe for me, the really compelling thing in the beginning of the book, when you start to trace the dissemination of Artaud's ideas at a moment when that kind of information was not easily accessible and it was shared through artists, through networks, and you even talk about, you know, the Delusian rhizome as a kind of model or a network. Um, and I wanted to maybe start there and just have you maybe trace a little further this idea of how, even with like the early translation published at Black Mountain College, you know, which is in itself an important network to consider in this context, but just the transmission of his ideas. Cause you know, you think many, many years later to figure like, <laughs> Baudrillard, who was translated through semi-text and also, you know, as a sort of French intellectual had this tremendous impact on American artists and thinkers about art. Um, but even then there were different modes of dissemination that didn't exist, you know, in the 50s or the 60s. And you're also brilliant, I think, about tackling, you know, both the East Coast and the West Coast. And even just those were different networks in their own right. And just to kind of think about um, how this European intellectual was effectively, you know, working his way rhizomatically through a cluster of artists. Um, and then maybe just on that fi final point, you know, just to think about that network effectively, which was a somewhat incoherent network. Um, but a little, 
yeah, just I'm thinking about Cage himself, or just so many of the artists that you deal with who were rewriting the rules for how we thought about the social as an artistic space uh, to function in. And that's certainly true if you want to focus on performance, even just bringing in the notion of collaboration, of audience, of this idea that it's not just a single figure functioning in a studio alone, but that you know you are part of this network of, of beings. Um, but in any case, I just, you know, maybe we could start if you want with Black Mountain or, or with any aspect of that early period of the Van Gogh essay uh, and just how this made its way into the communities you discuss. Yeah, I th and I think that's, a, it, it's really important actually, because as you say, really it's reliant on networks. And it's actually, I think a lot of those early instances of, of his work kind of arriving on American shores are reliant on friendships. Um, so one of the, the kind of most time consuming parts of tracing all of that is that is the evidence of these kind of exchanges and, and you know, um, packages of, of photo stats sent from one person to another exists in, in personal correspondence and archives. So that you have this sort of moment where, you know, Jean-Jacques Lebel is, taking recordings of the, the um, radio play to have done with the judgment of God. And he's sending those to people that he knows in the US to Amiri Baraka, to um, Jack Hirschman, to Mike McClure. You have um, David Tudor and Mary Caroline Richards at Black Mountain College who are kind of, you know, being sent um, copies of the French version of the theatre and its double um, by dancers that they're associating with. So you kind of have this moment where it's almost like kind of rumour and friendship networks and and um, I suppose poetry networks also that allow for the dissemination quite slowly. So the first instance of, of Otto's work being published in the US, as Anthony said, is actually in the Tiger's Eye, um, who reprinted um, the Van Gogh essay um, in, in their 90, March 1949 issue. They had actually gone out to Paris and kind of sought out avant-garde French texts to publish alongside the work of American poets and mainly abstract expressionist painters actually. So you have this sort of wonderful moment there and then subsequently in little magazines and poetry journals, so not just Evergreen Review for example, but, but you know Northwest Review, Bread and you know those really kind of tiny run poetry journals where Arto's work is appearing alongside the work of contemporary poets, um, which is this kind of really wonderful moment that he's almost immediately kind of framed as a contemporary. Um, and, and Otto is not, not the only kind of European um, avant-garde writer whose, whose work is kind of being published in that way. But I think it, it means that his work is often published in fragments, um, either because things are being censored or because there's just not room and they've only got one page, so they'll print, you know, 11 lines of something. Um, it, it's really kind of bitty and it's really dependent on those, on those kind of networks and friendships and, and rumour and correspondence. But there are also multiple points of entry. So I think that the kind of standard narrative is that, you know, John Cage was the person who kind of brought Artaud to American shores. And, and that's not really quite the case because you have that early work going on at Black Mountain where MC Richards is translating the theater in its double um, from about 1950, 1951. She's giving readings from that. So really there's a lot of kind of discussion around it even before the book is published in 1958. And I think that moment of the early 50s is really interesting to me because that's when you see unpublished texts and translations circulating. And these poets and artists archives are kind of filled with, you know, these sort of informal as yet unpublished typescript translations, even before those things are actually kind of making their way into the pages of, of books and, and poetry magazines. Um, so in some senses, it's this sort of, he inhabits these underground networks already, just by virtue of the, the kind of way in which things are being shared and disseminated. 
Um, and that's absolutely, that's happening in San Francisco. It's happening at Black Mountain College. It's happening um, in New York, kind of around Grove Press and, and Evergreen Review. And then later on in, in Greenwich Village around Judson. Um, one of the things I'm trying to do, I suppose, is, is to sort of delineate some of the links between those different spaces and sites actually um so to kind of think about you know the relationships between the black mountain poets and and the san francisco renaissance to think of figures like rachel rosenthal actually as somebody who kind of you know moves from east to west coast um, and is is sort of connected with lots of those people, although not doesn't kind of self identify as being part of one of those groups, if you like. So, you, you know, I think that there's something to be said for for thinking through this history is emerging simultaneously in multiple spaces, actually, rather than having this kind of one linear point of ingress. Um, and in some senses, I think, you know, we could sort of take that almost kind of metaphorically and, and think about about that idea of, of boundaries and borders actually because it, it's a much more kind of permeable state of affairs than than we might normally think of when we think of you know the the sort of posthumous publication of a writer um I loved that I, I loved that that kind of emphasis on the erotic though in the body um that you began with Stuart because I think it it is really important to, to kind of emphasize that, you know, I'm not kind of, I, I think Otto is not talking about the body as this kind of abstract conceptual metaphor, that it, it's about, you know, bodies. <laughs> it's about kind of surfaces and guts and skin and, and you know, cells and atoms. And, you know, the idea that, that kind of revolution is something that happens in the stuff of the body. And, and that's really messy. Um, and it allows us to think about assemblage art and performance, um, but also the kind of that that crossing of boundaries and and the kind of undoing of clear boundaries between positions in yeah, art. Absolutely. I mean, the one anecdote I forgot to show too. Um, in 1989, I had an internship at the New Museum, and Nancy Sparrow's survey was was on view in that moment. And she and Leon basically came to the museum almost every weekday to have lunch with the staff. And so she was very present. And that was exactly the same summer as the Robert Maplethorpe controversy um, that basically, you know, brought down the NEA as we knew it. But, and, you know, we were actively going to act up demonstrations with Nancy Sparrow, you know, it was just this super turbocharged moment. But again, because, you know, 89 was still before any of, you know, effective AIDS medications had really come on, uh, on board yet. And so there was this, you know, equation with, you know, between sex and death, you know, between sex and violence on some level, or certainly her work had a very particular impact and charge in that moment. And, you know, I remember the Arto Codex in particular, just feeling so urgent in that, in that moment. And then fast forward many, many years later, and, you know, Julie Ault, who was heavily involved too with group material in that moment, you know, curated Nancy's show at, at PS1 here in New York. Um, and, you know, it's a different moment now. Clearly we're just emerging from yet another pandemic, but I think it is interesting to think of Arto and, you know, this question of illness, this question of erotics, you know, bodies are not controllable things necessarily. And that also raises the question of chance and cage and just control, you know, as you've already outlined, systems of power seek to control us. And so the degree to which he proposes this model emphatically against any organized measure of control is just such a powerful idea for so many artists, I think. And, you know, we're also clearly still in this major reckoning right now about institutions, museums, you know, any organizing structure to create coherence um, and at what price. And so I guess it just, you know, the work, his work and the work he has impacted just feels so urgent to me yet again for different reasons. But I do feel that, you know, the art world often has been deeply um, phobic about erotics. And I don't necessarily mean erotica, but I mean, you know, Kara Lee had to fight so hard <laughs> to get anyone really to understand the power of her work. And so I just think her position in this book is so exciting uh, and how you situate her, you know, in this legacy. I don't know if you want to, I mean, in general, I would love to talk about too, uh, Rachel Rosenthal, Nancy, Carol, Kara Lee, and just, 
Well, you know, even going back to Germain Dulac and the seashell of the clergyman, and, you know, if our toe was a fallen angel of surrealism, um, you know, it's always been fascinating to me that I think two of the greatest filmmakers and maybe artists of the 20th century were Maya Darren and Germain Dulac, and both of them would effectively refuse the label of surrealism um, for many reasons. Uh, but I think it's, it's so interesting and so complicated, Artaud's involvement, you know, in that, that narrative. But maybe, I don't know, do you want to talk a little bit about his relationship, maybe to our understanding of what we might now call feminist practice, but maybe there's a different way of phrasing it that would be more accurate in this context. Yeah, I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because, um, and, and one of the things that I kind of really wanted to do was think about what was at stake for those women who um, both translated Otto and then also kind of took up that, 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 challenge of, of, of kind of bodily um, reorganization, <laughs> let's call it that. Um, several of his early translators were women, actually so, several of the poets who translated his work for the Otto anthology. Um, and, you know, really Rachel Rosenthal was a, a really kind of early proponent of his work. She was able to read it in French, obviously. And I think she, that there's a kind of wonderful, um, parallel between what Rachel was doing in the mid 1950s with this kind of you know absolute desire to kind of push things off balance is is how she described it so that kind of constant unsettling and placing the body her body but also the bodies of, of the actors in instant theater in, into these kind of spaces of discomfort, I suppose, physically, but also kind of symbolically and, and in, in theatrical terms. And I, I think Carolee kind of picked that up in a sense <clears throat> in those works from the early 1960s where, she, <clears throat> where she's, she's again kind of in, invested in in pushing back against those structures that kind of seek to gender and to kind of place actors and bodies and people within particular kind of gendered positions. And, and I think for her, that's about the body, it's about language um, as it kind of plays out in something like Meet Joy. But I think you're right. I think for, for a long time, her work was kind of taken as being erotic in the sense of, you know, kind of naked bodies writhing and it's all very kind of, you know, sexy. But actually there's something really kind of um, urgent and rigorous going on there when those bodies come into contact with each other and become this other thing, which is a kind of pile of writhing bodies, but is also a, a sort of um, almost like a kind of organism that pushes back against separation and compartmentalization. Um, and I think, I don't know, Meet Joy is a, a work that I can come back to again and again and absolutely never tire of and never quite grasp, I think. Um, but, but those works feel still really urgent and important um and I think you know I think you're absolutely right about about you know I, I kind of finished the book in 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 the 70s really um but there is a kind of a, a, an ongoing urgency to that kind of call to pay attention to the body um in that very kind of physical literal sense um that runs through the 80s but I think you know we we see contemporary artists now engaging with our toe in that same way because of course you know we're kind of, we're kind of still struggling with with a lot of those a lot of those similar um kinds of constraints um actually going going back to the book in the context of the pandemic has been quite strange because one of one of the things that i look at is our toes model of the theater as a as plague which obviously I wrote pre-pandemic, um, but but that idea that that illness is something that kind of challenges society and and leads at some point to a kind of reorganization, and that that happens through bodies and and suffering bodies actually I think is really 
is really crucial. It's a hard, it, it's actually, I find it a hard chapter to go back to now um, in, as we are living through this new plague. Um, but I think, I think we, there is that demand that we kind of pay attention to bodies, not just as, not just as kind of sites of victimization actually, but, but as, as sites potentially of revolt and anarchy and the anarchic body, I think for our toe and, and for Carolee and for Rachel and, and for Bruce Connor, that anarchic body has a huge amount of power. Absolutely. Artistically and socially. Yeah, and again, I, I wanna keep focus on the book, but I, I have been thinking in the last day or two, just a lot about Pobel and his connection to this book too, and, and to your argument. And I think he would be a fascinating figure to maybe for a, a sequel <laughs> yes. um, for a lot of reasons. But, and you know, again, he was so invested in the experimental theater scene in mm -hmm. New York, you know, in the seventies and early eighties. Um, so it wasn't that much later, you know, in the grander scheme of things. And, and I think it is important too, to kind of continue to push on, you know, certainly how questions of race and gender can really be understood through this broader lens of Arto's, you know, sort of intangible influence. Um, you know, it just, it's, it's a very generative framing, I think, of his mm -hmm. project so that it, it, you know, you can really understand how so many other practices do emerge from the 60s and 70s and 50s. Um, but maybe just, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about language in general too, because certainly with Nancy Sparrow, it's like a very literal manifestation. And again, that moment when I was at the New Museum was also the moment that you were actively seeing like Barbara Kruger and Jenny Holzer works on the streets. And they were, you know, like Vila Glay like, you know, just peeling off, you know, it was visceral. It was not, it was very analog. And, you know, it was kind of part of the immediate context, but there was that sense again of, a physical urgency to language and its connection to the body. Uh, and you really felt that in Nancy's work in particular, I think. And you know, you felt like she was like breaking something apart as well as perhaps putting it back together. But um, you know, I, I also think certainly Popel too, like there are so many links between his work in language and how he uses his body that I think is absolutely comes out of this, this question. So maybe, yeah, and you've already talked about you know, the proximity to poetry um, in, the, in, in how the work was disseminated. Uh, maybe you could talk about Michael McClure as well, but I just, you know, I just think this connection between language and practices with body at the center of them is a really interesting question for me. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that kind of the links between language on the page and language in the body, um, are, are really crucial. You know, lot, lots of the poets that we see translating Arto, but you know, people like Michael McClure and, and Jack Hirschman, you know, th that kind of poetry is is poetry that is sort of spoken and uttered and, and also located in the body. So I think, you know, it, it, these practices, and I absolutely agree that, Popel is such a would be such a fascinating kind of extension of this and we see it in those other artists from the 80s that you know language is not something that's separate from the body it's something that comes out of the body but it's also something that acts on the body and that that kind of you know I suppose what we see in in Sparrow's works is that the language on the page feels both violent but also kind of violated that she is, yeah, absolutely. She is kind of subjecting that text to a kind of violence and an undoing and a dismantling just in the way that she is kind of materially presenting it. So I always feel in her works, both these, those typescript Codex Arto scrolls, but also the earlier Arto paintings, that language is such a kind of physical thing and even the typed word on the page then is, is torn and it's overlapped and it, you know, has these kind of big kind of chasms running through it. And then those, you know, those kind of violent phallic tongues that kind of jut into it. Um, I think draw those really kind of clear links between between languages as words and symbolic meaning and and the kind of relationship that that has to bodily experience. 
Um, and particularly, I suppose, then, you know, to, to, to women's bodily experience, to, to the kind of experiences of those who are oppressed or, or kind of excluded. Um, but again, I think with her, the, 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 it, it's not, those are not works about kind of suffering and victimization. You know, even though that's perhaps where they come from, that actually I think there is a, a real kind of power to the, the forms that she includes. Yeah, I mean, I guess maybe that's a really interesting question is like the distinction and or relationship between dismantling, dismembering and empowerment, <laughs> yeah. you know, like the degree to, but again, yeah. I mean, how do you translate? I mean, we should talk about translation again in general, which is I think an interesting question here, but like the translation between this sort of abject system and empowerment on the other, you know, on the flip side and how do you get from one to the next and the degree to which so many of these artists were, you know, invoking Artaud's ideas to really put pressure on how we understood a social space or a political space or the organization of those spaces. Um, so the more that one can reorganize language through these techniques, the one that, you know, hypothetically you reorganize the, the social body. Um, so, yeah, and I mean, Capro too, that becomes a really interesting question, I think in that regard. And, and you talk beautifully about, about his book, but maybe you could talk a little bit about, I mean, yeah, I mean, your argument about Capro and, and again and language in that regard too. Yeah, I think I mean I think that that kind of sense of reordering as a as a, a kind of process of resistance runs through lots of the works that I look at. And I suppose, but you you've also kind of really beautifully got it at some of the tensions behind that, because you know, the, the kind of notion that if you dismantle the body, you gain some sort of empowerment. I suppose leads to that question of like what what's the logical end point of that like at, at what point do you do you suddenly become empowered and I, I think you know that actually I feel like Bruce Connor, Alan Caprow, Sparrow, maybe all of the artists that I discuss are kind of pushing at that question and for those feminist artists for Sparrow, for Schneeman there's also that question of kind of what what you do with this male modernist, misogynist, probably, um, author, you know, is citation the, the way to do that? Can, you know, can that be empowering or not? And I think those tensions are, are what make it interesting. And those kind of moments of, of feeling along the limits of that, that sense of empowerment or kind of you know if, if you take Arto to the logical endpoint then in fact the the work of art is entirely destroyed right the body is entirely dismantled and it sort of ceases to exist or it becomes so disseminated that it that it isn't there anymore and that's not a particularly kind of you know, at that point, it's it's less of a useful model. So I think I, I'm quite interested in those those tensions and those contradictions. Actually, um, in the in the case of of happenings, in the case of Caprow, I really wanted to kind of explore that idea of of that that moment almost when the work disappears, when the happening is being performed by multiple anonymous people in unknown sites in different countries. And so actually it's impossible to capture. And is that the moment when actually we see like a, a kind of true theater of cruelty? You know, it's not about those early sixties, aggressive shouty happenings. That's, that's the kind of, I think that's the standard that sort of version of, of our toe and happenings, isn't it? That, you know, if, if someone's kind of pushing a lawnmower towards you and shouting at you, then, <laughs> you know, that's cruel, but, but actually, I think, you know, if we kind of think about that idea of dismantling and the idea of kind of undoing social structures, positions, expectations, and, and recrafting them as something else that is dissipated, that is not bounded, then actually, you know, in, in, in kind of self-service, for example, where, you know, multiple things happening in different places at different times, we don't really know what they were. So I think that that's a really kind of interesting idea that that almost infinite expansion of the work of the body um but yeah i mean now i just have this sort of mental juxtaposition in my head of like you know connor's black dahlia 
let you talk about a bit, and, and Sparrow, again, for instance, and just the question of violence against women in particular. And, you know, the theater of cruelty existed before our toe. I mean, it was our society, effectively. And so I think he obviously <laughs> puts a spotlight on that. Um, so, you know, in a sense, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just such an amazing group of artists that you discuss, because I just think it immediately highlights that to some extent, which is why the Sontag quote is also very interesting in a way, because, you know, again, if you, if erotics have been conventionally defined through a gender binary, uh, and now we're in a moment where even that is being questioned and dismantled in very powerful ways. Um, and I think that that is something that, you know, certainly Carol Lee was very, I think, was inclined to start thinking about quite early and in quite progressive ways. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I guess, how do you think it does relate to, you know, because at the moment we're also in a moment, you know, I feel like every discussion I have uses words like violence and extraction. And, you know, so the question of violence and again, of plague, of um, all of these forms of oppression, for lack of a better word, that create forms of violence uh, and how Arto as a strategy, whether it's literally bound to his texts or if it's, it's more of an imaginary as you sort of discuss, like how is that used as a tool? And, you know, I just feel like so much of the period you're discussing is still dealing with the aftermath of a war or certain questions, but then there's still a ripple effect, you know, from that too, of course. Um, anyway, but yeah, I just wonder how you might just think a little bit about, you know, this, this question of violence um, and cruelty and where you think Arto, I mean, where we should literally be looking to his text versus how it was sort of translated or reinterpreted through the work you discuss. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And I think if we go back to his texts, they themselves are often quite violent, yeah. both in terms of a kind of desire for revolution, but actually often kind of violent towards particular subjects. Um, and I would never kind of want to pretend that his texts are entirely unproblematic because, you know, there are these kind of moments of, of um, uh, kind of meanness actually in there. So I think there is, there is a lot to be said for Sontag's approach actually, which is sort of thinking through, and, and I think, you know, uh, quite a lot of the artists and poets that I discuss really were kind of invested in the spirit of those texts as much as kind of following them word for word and sentence for sentence as a kind of blueprint for some kind of artistic or social revolt, right? So in some senses, the, the kind of thing that we have to do is take what's useful in them and then discard them or, or tear them up or, you know, kind of overlap them like Nancy Sparrow does. And I think, you know, we also see those moments where particularly in Sparrow, actually, where we see her kind of almost sort of pushing back against taking those texts too faithfully. And that lack of faithfulness, I think, is is actually what's really powerful in in, in lots of what's it's happening. So, almost. I mean, yeah, 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 absolutely. So, you know, the, the fact that the translations are not, you know, not terribly grammatically accurate, the fact that they're excerpted or they're fragmented, the the kind of fact that that people are kind of using bits of our toe rather than, you know, faithfully kind of subscribing to his whole project in some senses you can't subscribe to his old project because it's kind of incoherent. And, and, and you know, Arto writes in such a way that, that he kind of almost enacts violence on his own writing as he's writing. So it, th there's a kind of paradox in there that I think is actually really productive that, you know, really to kind of get at the spirit of it, you have to kind of absorb it and then reject it <laughs> and, 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 and kind of, um, uh, well, I think um, MC Richards talked about kind of, you know, ch chewing it up and spitting it out that that actually, you know, you've kind of absorbed what's useful, yeah. but then you've kind of made it into something else. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm working on a major project at the moment with Adam Pendleton, and he's so invested in this question of language and sort of repetition and difference, for lack of a better term, you know, and I, I think it's exactly the system that you kind of describe in the book where you take... <laughs> 
history or an historical source and you repeat it and you repeat it, you repeat it. And, and it's almost sort of like Alvin Lucy as I am sitting in a room, there's like dissonance that is created and it's a stuttering. You know, it doesn't repeat smoothly over time. Each iteration is a little different. And so, and you know, you could say that of any performance, like no performance is ever the same twice. And so there is something in that logic that I think has everything to do with your argument in the book. Um, whereas, you know, you have this matrix of an idea that is then broken down and broken down and broken down and reassembled. So in a way, assemblage is the natural form for this in some way. Does that make sense? It's like... Yeah, absolutely. And I think, and it's interesting because, you know, I look at kind of, con you know, contemporary artists or kind of projects that have happened recently. And I, I close with that, that relatively recent, although now probably a decade old um, installation by Terry Allen, but it's right. almost like the kind Please. of retelling and the retelling and the retelling and you know you kind of go back to the story of Varto and you retell it again but absolutely every kind of iteration there is I love that idea of that kind of dissonance or that distance or or the kind of stuttering because it's not the same thing but somehow there's a kind of compulsion to, to kind of retell it again um, and to and to use it in in that particular moment um, and the, the works that I I talk about in the book are at once these, you know, really kind of historically grounded. They're very kind of of that moment, but the ideas in them are kind of much um, broader, I think. Um, and so, you know, we, we still kind of look to somehow to our toe there, you know, artists are still looking to our toe to kind of find those um, useful bits, if you like. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think that I think that repetition is really is really fascinating, and um, I'm I'm kind of really keen to to avoid that sense that there is this kind of monolithic, correct version of our toe that if only we understand it right, we'll have the the answer because actually that it's visions and versions and slippages and and kind of retellings um, and and yeah, absolutely the kind of the the act of translation or transposition kind of works as a, a useful way of thinking that through I think but there's something more to that yeah and I guess even just I mean it, it made me sort of just think more broadly about questions about how any body of text literature theory whatever you know its relationship to a broader era of artistic practice and so you know certainly in the high 80s you had Baudrillard in particular but you had I think a lot of there was a lot of criticism about how tethered art had become to a certain notion of French theory. And at the same time, you make very clear, you make a point clearly in the beginning of the book that, you know, you don't position these artists as activists by any means, but they are deeply political artists. Mm -hmm. But because the structure that you do propose of an understanding of art is open-ended. It's not meant to be instrumentalized. It's not meant to be a one-on-one -on -one correlation but it's almost like this kind of weather system, you know, that just keep, you know, reforming in different ways in each body of work that you discuss, if that makes sense. But um, no, I just, but I, I do keep, and again, just because I, you know, as you know, I love Connor and I love Carrie so much. And I just think how this book will impact how we do think of assemblage, whether you want to talk about it literally as a physical assemblage or forms of assembly, you know, or any, notion of this kind of networked um, production that you talk about. Um, and, you know, again, I think the way you analyze the distribution of his ideas has everything to do with that physical form that some of the work then takes. Mm -hmm. uh, or even how the less physical form that the memory of certain works take, like Meet Joy. You know, Meet Joy is now an anecdotal enterprise. So we only understand it really, of course there's footage of it and photographs, but ultimately like, you know, I mean, sadly, I was not there. <laughs> so we, you know, when we rely on it and even in terms of, um, you know, our strategy for acquiring performances, especially Simone Fortis, for instance, her dance constructions, you know, is built on this idea of muscle memory that, you know, because we are lucky enough that Simone is still alive and you, you know, going back to the body yet again, that, you know, you have to embed the body in the conservation systems in the institution. And, and I just think, you know, and this again comes back to the Sontag book and to this notion of erotics and not losing sight of the body and its centrality to the question. Uh, yeah, and that idea of muscle memory, I think, is a really beautiful way of thinking about about how our toe kind of works in in so many of these practices. That it's it's exactly it's exactly that kind of um, focus on on the body 
as an iterative mechanism um, and an organism that I think is is really crucial and and absolutely you know assemblage kind of works in that way but but is related then to these other perhaps more conceptual performance practices um, in a way I think that that kind of Arto allows us to to see across those different types of practice. Um, I'm aware that we are probably running out of time. Yeah, we have, it's officially seven, but if, I, if I'm allowed to ask one last question, but I, you know, again, just because we are in such a politically intense moment, you know, and I, and I think we're all looking at art in general, its institutions um, and how they can better reflect some of the urgent questions we all have as a society right now. And I just wonder to what extent, I mean, you've already mentioned, you know, obviously you wrote the, the bit on plague before the pandemic, but just, you know, I do think that this book is a useful tool to think through some of those questions about artists and how they have engaged with, you know, particularly um, in a bit of an avant-garde ideas through Arto. Um, but where they really are about a, a form of dismantling of dismembering. And, you know, I think these are strategies that have a lot of currency right now. Um, so maybe if we have one minute left, <laughs> I see Anthony reappearing. Yeah, I, I hate, I, yeah, absolutely. I think that that kind of dis, disorganization, that dismantling feels sort of just as, as vital now as, as um, it must have felt in the Cold War era, I guess. I don't want to finish on a downer, but I, I also worry that institutions have a kind of muscle memory. And, and I suppose it's 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 which of those um it is kind of more powerful and urgent at the end of the day. But but yeah, I think increasingly, you know, our conversations are are always oriented towards that that notion of constraint and and pressure and and pressure on very real pressure. On, on actual bodies, as well as those kind of more metaphorical pressures on social bodies. Um, so I feel, I feel like, I hope there is still kind of usefulness in these ideas. And I, I know that there is still, you know, usefulness and, and meaning in the works that I discuss, which feel as urgent now as, as when they were made in the 50s, 60s, 70s. But I think Artaud's work too, I think it, it, it is still useful. Um, and that's, you know, that's what makes it really powerful. Thank you for giving us such an excellent guide. Thank you so much, Stuart. Yeah, thank you so much, both of you. Um, it's funny because as, uh, as I was reading your book, um, I completely by chance, I came across a quote by uh, Gregory Badcock. Mm -hmm. And uh, the quote says, art has got to begin to perform. Art should either be entertaining, outrageous, provocative, or insightful. And he goes on to uh, talk about the modern artist who has allowed himself to be colored and leashed and led down the path of philosophy and poetry. And it's, it's hard not to hear, I mean, of course I was in the middle of your book when I was read this, but it's hard not to hear echoes of Artaud in this. Um, and you mentioned this in the conversation when you talk about this, this stuttering and this, um, the, the, the way that this, um, that, that Arto sort of reappears and becomes important again for different groups and definitely for queer politics in the, after May 68 uh, and in the 70s in the US, um, you, you hear Arto's voice very much. Um, I'm thinking of in France of Guy Okangem, um, who was um, you know, a writer and, and, uh, and was the, the founder of the um, Homosexual Front for Revolutionary Action. Um, and um, and who and you can hear in his kind of uh, in his writing, which is not very uh, very present in the states, has not been translated that much. But you can hear Arto so much in, in the liberation of desire and uh, and the importance of the body embodiment and and the, the sort of the very the gory nature of the body, the sort of the bloody nature of it all. Uh, but anyway, so thanks a lot for for the this conversation. Um, and it'll be, I guess, uh, a sequel, as, as, as Stuart was saying. <laughs> Say that again? Oh, uh -oh. You were on mute, I think. Ooh, maybe not. Uh, anyway. All right. Um, 
anyway, so we will have a recording of this event um, posted immediately afterwards. So if you missed the beginning, if you want to share it with a friend, um, you can uh, just uh, click on the link on our website. It'll be ready in just a minute. Um, and you can see all our previous events uh, as well. They are available to watch. Um, if you want to reserve Lucy's book, uh, send us an email at 192books.com. Uh, and you can also, of course, come to the shop every day. We're open daily. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Uh, Fridays and Saturdays, we're open until seven. Uh, and you can also use our bookshop page um, uh, if you can't make it down to Chelsea. So you've got a lot of ways to, uh, to get this book for yourself. Um, you can find more information uh, on our website, 192books.com, and also sign up for our email newsletter for information on upcoming events. Our next event is going to be, we will welcome John Tresh, who is a historian of art, science, and folk practice to discuss his new book, The Reason for the Darkness of the Night, Edgar Allan Poe and the Forging of American Science. And he will be in conversation with the writer Paul Lafarge. And this will be next Tuesday, June 15th at 6 p.m. So please tune in. And until then, thanks again, Lucy. Thanks, Stuart. And thank you everyone for joining us and have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you.